Well, welcome everyone. I'm here for a special episode, a special edition of our Brighter Days Through Better Movement podcast series as we get ready for the summer solstice on June 20th, the brightest day of the year. And it certainly will be in 2021 since we've, you know, getting through this pandemic and um, we want to get everyone to be the healthiest and the best form they can be in preparation for the summer. And to help us on that journey is the one and only from Ortho Road Island, Dr. Keith Monchek. Dr. Monchek, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Michelle. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So I'm excited today. We're going to talk about you. We all want to hear what you've been doing. You are a real Rhode Islander, I'd say. When I was actually, I always laugh when I look at your bio because it's like, I went to Brown. I did this at Rhode Island Hospital and this at Rhode Island Hospital and this at Rhode Island Hospital. So, and now involved with colleges and schools here. So there's a lot of people in this community that know you. So they want to know how you've managed this pandemic, what you're looking forward to, how you have continued to stay as fit and healthy as you obviously are. And then also let's talk about the kids, the high school kids, the college kids, how this pandemic's impacted them and what do we see the future looking like as far as their, not just their athletic abilities, but maybe their grit, they're resilient, some of the other things, hopefully some of the positive things that they might have um, discovered through this, and maybe they'll all feel a little bit better after listening to this about what they've been through. So there's a lot. All right, now's my job. A lot, lot, lot of topics there. I know. All right, let's start with you. Tell me, how's the last year been, and how have you managed to be in this place today and sitting there smiling and get through it? Oh, I think it's smiling because we're headed into a spring season, which uh, for the most of us means uh, in the state of Rhode Island, I, I always say that that wintertime is like hibernation. Uh, we all kind of like 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 a bear when it hits uh, November to about February or March, we kind of all go into uh, this recluse mode and uh, the seasonal affective disorder kicks in uh, at high gear. But uh, as we as we emerge from that into the spring, we get some, uh, we get warmth and we get outdoor activities and we get sun and uh, we get looking, you know, looking forward to going back to the beaches and the pools. And especially in a time of pandemic, you know, the more things we can do, as everybody remembers from last summer, while it wasn't the most ideal summer, it's better than the winter. So uh, I think with the advent of a, of a vaccine and uh, our ability to get some warmer weather as it's snowing today, but uh, eventually we'll get warm, uh, we'll get back outdoors and I think socialization will become a little bit easier. I think the positivity rate from COVID is going to go down. Uh, and I think people are going to resume kind of outdoor sports. And and for me, uh, athletics uh, refreshes. It, uh, it's an opportunity to kind of uh, reset yourself both physically and mentally. And uh, that's try. It's what I've been trying to do over the course of the winter, uh, trying to stay as active as I can in as the most ingenious ways uh, that I could possibly imagine. So. So what have you discovered during the last year? Is there different ways that you've, you know, I don't know if you were a gym goer before or if you'd go outside and run or what you did, but how have you managed to stay um, active during the darker months? Well, it's funny. Usually, so I, I, I love exercise. Uh, I'm not just because my schedule, uh, the, the gym is not something that uh, kind of fits into my schedule. I, I'm an active squash player. So usually from October till March or April, I'll play in the Rhode Island Scholastic Squash League. Uh, with the advent of COVID, we we are playing with masks, uh, but the league really you know didn't emerge as as much. So uh, it's more kind of more of hitting, which really doesn't keep us active. Uh, I have substituted. Uh, I, I have to admit, as we were discussing a little earlier, I have fallen into the Peloton cult. Uh, it seems that everybody either loves and has fallen in uh, you know deep love with their Peloton, or they hate somebody who has a Peloton. Um, and I have become the uh, the person who's kind of fallen into the cult for a couple reasons. One, uh, it it's a great way for me to stay active at home. Uh, it's allowed me to uh, combine both uh, strength training, cardio training, bike training. Uh, as well as something I've just got into yoga to, to increase my flexibility and work on core strength uh, and do it kind of on my own time. And second, it's really given me that socialization that I've missed from my squash world. Uh, squash you know, nights uh, in, in the, uh, the round squash league or Monday nights, and they're 
great opportunities to play, but also to see friends and to hang out with, you know, 20, 30 people who love playing the sport. And uh, you watch other people fr play and friends play and you get odd games. And it's that kind of interaction during exercise that, uh, you know, a lot of people love is, you know, not just uh, getting the exercise itself, but the camaraderie that comes along with it. And this kind of Peloton community with coworkers and friends across the country who uh, have uh, absolutely fallen in love with theirs has given me the ability to uh, get a little of my competitive spirit out. So it's been fun. So I have a quick question for you. Have you ever taken a photograph of where you finished in a Peloton class and, and your age happens to be a little bit higher than the people behind you and then shared it with your friends or your spouse? Uh, maybe many <laughs> times, <laughs> many times I, I, I would say, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, I have, I, I, I admit I, I have. Okay. All right. So, so this is a usual middle-aged male thing to do. Like, woohoo. I, I think it's, a, I think it's honestly, I think it's part of that Peloton cult thing because, uh, it's funny, you know, sharing it's not so much as a, uh, you know, look what I did and you didn't. I think it's more of a, look what I did personally, as far as against, what I have done. So every time I get a new kind of personal record in, in a bike or an endurance activity, it's more self-rewarding than it is beating somebody else. Uh, and I enjoy seeing when other people get that. So, and, and it's great, you know, the, it is, it is really fulfilled my kind of strength, endurance and flexibility and core, um, that I was getting from other things all kind of in, in one, in one area. And it works great for my schedule. And I think people have done, uh, you know, obviously you don't need a Peloton. I think people have kind of created their own home gyms and their home activities and have, have changed up a little bit of how they do their exercise in that home that, that fits them uh, to get through kind of this winter without being at a gym or without doing their, their tennis club or their, um, their basketball league at night or their hockey league at night. They've, they've, they've substituted uh, pretty well. Oh, great points. You bring up a really great point in that, yes, it's really important to exercise. And we all, we, we can talk about it till we're blue in the face. You need strength training and cardiovascular and stretching, et cetera, et cetera. But there's another part that's really important too, and is to find something you enjoy. And that typically often involves other people. And it's been really nice to see how people have used their imagination. So yeah, you can't play squash and hang out on a Monday night with all your buddies afterward. However, you've become part of the Peloton cult. And for many of us, we've all done it in different ways. Like I'm on Strava, a social media platform, which shows how much I run or walk. And I see people I know and you know like it and things. And it's not because I'm like going, oh, look what I did. It's more to be like, hey, I'm still moving. I'm continuing to move forward. And it creates those, helps to develop those relationships with us, which is important for our well-being as well. Yeah, I, I think sharing, you know, sharing what you do is is healthy. Um, I, I think, you know, I'm not one who has a social media account, so I don't have an Instagram account. I don't have a Twitter account. I don't have a, I don't even have a Facebook account. Um, but in, in this kind of community that we've created, and it's not just Peloton, I mean, at the, uh, you know, as part of going back to the squash that I had done early on, we had some, uh, some squash, uh, home training that we did on zoom, uh, which was great that we would have, you know, 10, 15 members of our, of the squash club working with the pro, you know, in my basement on, you know, racket exercises and lungings and squats. And, you know, you weren't playing the sport, but you felt like, you know, you knew three, four or five people who were doing it with you. Um, and you got the sense of accomplishment at the end that, yeah, I didn't, I didn't go play a, a squash match, but you know what? I, I was with, you know, three, five, you know, seven of my friends and we got the next best exercise in possible. So, um, you know, like anybody, it's easy to sit on a couch and do nothing, but when you got someone who's pushing you just a little bit or, or going through the same discomfort or pain, it, it's a, it's a big reward. Well, it's again, it's been nice to see many of our colleagues in Rhode Island who own gyms or are part of clubs or have Pilates studios take a lot of what they're doing and put it online and make virtual ex experiences. And um, I'll be really interested to see once the pandemic goes what kind of role these virtual worlds continue to play um, in our ability to be able to network and remain active because we may prefer some of these 
some of these different methodologies for staying active rather than having to go back and actually play squash every Monday night. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be, an, I, I think it's here to stay. I mean, I think it's here to stay for a variety of reasons. One, you know, there are a lot of people who are intimidated of going to a gym. You know, they don't want to go to a gym. They'd rather kind of exercise, you know, privately, but at the same time are missing a little bit of that kind of group experience, but one that they can control a little, a little bit better, I think. Um, the, the second thing is, you know, I can't exercise every day or, or have some, you know, friendly competition with friends who live multiple states away or countries away. And now, you know, we, you know, we did something the other day where we had three number one, ex, you know, number one players in the world in squash calling in from France, and one was coming calling in from uh, Boston, and the, you know, the other one was calling in from uh, England at, at the same time, and so. Uh, that type of opportunity to expand your exercise world beyond your local gym is is huge. Well, I just hope it actually helps us integrate exercise into our recreation so it makes exercise and movement more accessible. So we all know that we end up being healthier people when exercise is incorporated into what we do. So you mentioned yoga. And at the moment, I have this picture, which seems a little inappropriate, of you in like a um, in leggings and a crop top, like doing a triangle pose. Do you want to speak a little bit more about yoga or stretching, however you want to sort of put it? And as an orthopedic surgeon, a sports medicine specialist, how do you think um, stretching yoga impacts a person's body? And not just for us middle-aged folks, but let's also think about our high schoolers, our collegiate athletes as well. Sure. So I kind of backed into yoga in a, in a way. I mean, I've always had many of patients who, who are just very much into it. You know, they, they kind of live, breathe, and, and, and do yoga. And I know it existed, and I knew it was good for flexibility, but never, you know, to me, the Zen kind of part of yoga, the part, you know, the kind of the inner being, that really never – had grasped me at all. And I'm not against it. It's just, that's not what really uh, attracted me to it. When we kind of went into pandemic world, I, I'm not someone who does a new year's resolution, but as far as when I began exercising, the two things that I really wanted to work on more was things that I was missing from, from my squash plane and from other, other activities, which was core strength and flexibility. Um, I, I said, I want to come out of this, this, uh, this pandemic, having a better core and having just more flexibility to help me reduce kind of injuries that I normally would see throughout the year, you know, as I am getting a little bit older uh, and, you know, the muscle length shrinks uh, a, a little and you're trying to continue to push the muscle length to what it used to go to. And uh, sometimes when you kind of hit that critical measures, when you start to gain injury. So I started on some of the stretching exercises that, uh, you know, that the Peloton would have and other things I would find online. And I would find that some of the static stretches just weren't getting me where I wanted to do. So I kind of dove into the, the world of yoga uh, without leggings. Um, with uh, I, do, I, I do do it barefoot, uh, but, you know, normal everyday shorts and shirt. Um, every, you know, a few weeks I learned a, a new pose. Uh, don't, don't repeat what happy baby is, but I learned that one the other night. Um, uh, the thing I found about yoga is that I can do it as part of my activity. Usually I'll do a ride uh, or a strength and then I'll finish with the yoga while I'm warm. And it's 15, very beginner level, 15 to 20 minutes. And I feel that I'm getting more of a stretch and more of a flexibility by doing this than I am the simple, regular, uh, everyday exercise. I'm I'm enjoying it just as much as, as a static stretch, um, but it lasts longer. And it seems that I, I feel like I've got more, um, more flexibility by the end of it. So I've incorporated, I, I haven't become a true yogi, but I, I have incorporated it three times a week into what I'm normally doing. And, and I start to see the results. I mean, maybe Tom Brady really does have something going with his TB12 method. Uh, but I can tell you flexibility uh, in the long run, especially coming from a sports medicine's perspective, prevents injury. Um, you know, the people who are tight, uh, especially like hamstrings, leads to low back pain. People who have 
uh, are tight or have uh, you know, decreased uh, ability to expand that that muscle uh, get themselves into into injuries earlier. So uh, I've enjoyed it. it, it it's really uh, increased that second thing that I wanted to do, and and it's worked on core as well. I love it. I love the message, not just for us as we're getting older, we're getting a little stiffer. You've given so many great messages in there. That being one, the other part being the dynamic nature of it. Um, we've we've all seen the research that shows that you're stretching is much more about optimizing the length of your muscles and soft tissues and doing it when you're warm and all of those things you're really just optimizing yeah your overall mobility and it does re reduce the risk of injury which ultimately optimizes your ability to perform in the best ways and i love that you incorporate it into what you do you don't have to suddenly say oh i'm going to schedule out an hour three times a week and become a yogi some people do that and that's great some people just do like, you know, three times a week for 15 minutes. It's a perfect amount to optimize your flexibility. And even as physical therapists, we're very much like, you've got to stretch. You've got to stretch everything out two to three times a week. Basically, that's what it is to just be healthy. So good for you. And maybe yeah, you it's, uh, maybe I'll send you Lululemon tights, though. Like a no, tight. I don't think so. Um, I don't want to scare too many people uh, away. So, but this is the advantage of doing it in the basement, right, of your own home. So nobody's watching, other than other than the dog who sits in the corner and shakes its head every once in a while. But that's about it. So tell me what message, or how would you, how what message would you give the football players, the kids? So we're out there right now who are learning that we are going to have a season. It's going to be a short season with very hard ground. And um, these are kids who you were once and you were a football player who did lots of strength training and let's be as bulky as we can and as fast as we can. How do we get our kids to incorporate things like 15 minutes of yoga into what they do, knowing that it actually can help to prevent injury and or more importantly, what they care about actually helps them to perform at a potentially at a higher level. Well, I think the good news is that, you know, the coaches today and the strength and conditioning coaches and the fitness and the trainers um, and the therapists and everybody who kind of associated with an athlete, I, I think they're, they're starting to get there a lot. I mean, if you really had looked at how kind of a, just a simple example, how a football team warms up, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you know, you would see a group of, of high school athletes all in a circle, uh, basically doing static stretching. Uh, and then they would start running uh, a couple little patterns. And then eventually the game would start. Now the static stretch is a very kind of a smaller component of it. And they do a ton of dynamic uh, starting, you know, stretching to begin with and, and dynamic work prior to, to the game. So things, things are absolutely changing. Um, I remember as far back as when I played college football, uh, you know, or maybe our coach or our college football coach was well ahead of his time, but he basically said that, you know, the people who are doing, uh, like the ballet and dance, he was threatening, you know, a bunch of college football players. That's where he was going to start because he believed that, uh, the dynamic stretch was better than the, than the static stretch. Um, so in, especially, you know, coming back to what you said in the shortened season, you know, most of these kids have been exercising, you know, throughout the year. There are some who haven't. There are some who really have have kind of been doing their own thing. And there's a difference between getting into, you know, can, you know shape and getting into play shape for whether it's lacrosse or football or field hockey or basketball. Um, so my recommendation to kids these days is you need to go out there and you need to start performing at, at, at interval level. So, you know, 25% max, then 50% max, and then 75% max. Trying to go from zero to 60 is a, is a recipe for disaster. And as far as injury goes as well. Um, so knowing when the, the season starts and starting it early, starting the, the dynamic work early uh, is going to prevent injuries in the long run. Now, so far in the pandemic, there has been shortened seasons for some of the winter sports, and, and it's a little all over the place. Have you seen any changes in the kinds of injuries or ailments from our high school and college kids in your office? That's a great question. You know, the, the biggest change that we've seen is we've seen less injury because there's less 
there's less formal sports that are going on. In fact, if you were to look at my practice for the most part, we've had a big dip in acute injuries of high school athletes just because the, the incident number has dramatically you know, dropped off. Conversely, our, our injury rate and in people who have home gyms and are trying to exercise for the first time and you know are doing things that are unsupervised in their basement and creating tough mutter courses in their backyard, that's gone through the roof. So as an orthopedic surgeon, I always say gravity and stupidity will always keep us in business. Um, it's probably the same with being a therapist as well. Uh, so, you know, patients, uh, you know, or, or people need to kind of realize what their, what their levels are. Um, from an injury perspective, uh, specific to the kids who we do see, uh, I think the majority of it uh, has actually decreased overuse injuries and initial sprain, initial strains have probably increased uh, within the first two weeks of each of these season, two to three weeks, just because kids in high school, most of them these days are coming off of another sport or they're coming off of an AAU or they're coming off of uh, you know a house league or a town league. So they're really playing, whether or not they're playing one sport or two sports, they're playing year round. Uh, that dipped during the pandemic, they, they're playing a lot less. Uh, so when they're asked to, to ramp it back up very quickly for the start of the season, we're seeing things like hamstring strains. We're seeing things like patella tendonitis. We're seeing things like shoulder strains. Um, just because the, the 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 level to which they're doing it is has increased rapidly at the start of a new season. Yeah. So to help people out there understand, instead of the athlete staying at sort of this level and you know up and down for for you know getting to this level through training, then kicking it up a notch during the actual season, and then sort of plateauing and down, we're seeing athletes starting from here and jumping straight up to a competitive level, which is too fast for their soft tissues to accommodate the physiological changes that need to occur to prevent an injury from happening. Are you worried about the upcoming seasons? We've potentially got winter and fall seasons being like short and sweet and squished together and one straight after the other. Any advice for our um, student athletes out there about how to manage that? Should they try to do both? Should they just pick one? How do they manage that? Well, I think starting now is 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 the most important because when when you condense a season, you condense the conditioning, you condense the training, you condense the workup for it. I mean, think about it for any high school athlete in in the state of Rhode Island. Your football season doesn't start in August. Your football season starts in May and June with captains' practices, and then it gets into more formal practices throughout the summer. They're doing running, they're doing group weightlifting with each other. So they've got this, as you said, the steady kind of increase that goes on throughout the summertime uh, until they finally get to uh, where they're really doing full out practices and they've had a good buildup. Uh, for anybody who has not had that, you know, start now is, would, would be the first thing. Um, and cross training is important, especially if you're going to switch seasons very quickly. Um, because each season and each entity, you know, has a, has a, a life of its own. I mean, anybody knows, I, I'll use a great example of my, I'll leave them un, unnamed, but I have a partner who played club hockey in, in, uh, at, in college and was invited to play a club hockey game the, the other night and a late night. And from what I hear, probably about 15 minutes into it, he was uh, a little nauseated and, and, and bent over in the bench. And this is someone who works out every day and, and works out every night and does weightlifting, but he wasn't in hockey shape. So that's kind of the moral of the story is that each sport has its own shape that you have to be in. So if you know you're going to play back-to-back -back seasons, you should be cross-training, you know, preparing for that second season while you're, while you're preparing for the first. So can you speak a little bit more about cross-training? Because I certainly know that you and I both see the advantages of cross-training, not just for injury prevention, but also so you can perform at the top of your game. When you talk about cross-training, are you doing it, are you just trying to do something completely separate so that you're working your muscles in different ways? Or are you talking about it, you're doing specific things that will complement your preparation for your sport? So I think it's I think it's both actually, Michelle. I, I I think you really have to focus on both. You know, the problem that we've come into in this country is that people become ultra specialized, right? So when you become ultra specialized, you condition your muscles very well to the top of its performance, but 
you're asking the same muscle groups and the same dynamic and the same static muscles to do it the same way every single time for a prolonged period of time. And that's how overuse injuries happen. Mm -hmm. What unfortunately doesn't happen is sometimes the complementary training doesn't exist. So for example, a, a professional baseball player with a shoulder problem, when they get injured, we don't, you know, we don't just rehab their shoulder. We rehab their core. We would rehab their lower body because that's where the force of the pitch comes from is from within the core and the shoulder kind of follows. So if a professional athlete or a high school athlete who's a pitcher is not doing that core, that lower body, et cetera, at the same time, and they're just pitching, 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 you're going to get an injury. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great point. So the cross training really is, it's working different muscles, different joints in different ways, but ultimately complementing you in the sport or in the functional activity that you're wanting to perform. How in your experience, and I know that you work with lots of different athletes and different teams, how do you think the pandemic is going to impact them? And I know it's very hard to make generalizations because I'm sure we can see both ends of the spectrums. We can see the kids who have like used this time to really understand their bodies and get more resilient and grittier and then we're, there's probably the other end of the spectrum spectrum as well those that have sat on the couch and played video games what are you seeing i i think i think we're seeing a lot of it i mean if you just talk about use in general you talk about under the you know high, under the college age level so you know middle school high school even in lower school i, I mean there is plenty of data throughout this pandemic to, to document at least the psychological effects that it has on everybody and, and being alone by themselves online all the time uh, is a kind of a depressing world for, for anybody, even adults who have to do it uh, for their job, you know, day in and day out and don't get much socialization from it. You know, exercise is such a great thing. You know, it, it, it allows you for, as, as you being a runner, uh, I could, I get that runner high. I, I mean, I get the idea of clearing your mind uh, and and getting your body to kind of move and to function. And from a psychological perspective, talk to any runner who can't run, right? It's, it, it's like the world has caved in. And I think that's what the experience of a lot of kids are who normally have other outlets that they can, you know, that they can use both from a socialization standpoint and from an exercise standpoint. I mean, guidelines, if you look at, uh, you know, see the, the national guidelines for health, it's 20 minutes a day of exercise. And, and it doesn't matter if you're a young kid or if you're an older person, you got to get your heart rate and get it elevated 20 minutes. And that's, that's good for, for or my uh, psychological perspective. And it's good for a cardiovascular perspective. And there are a lot of people in this pandemic that aren't getting anywhere close to 20 minutes of exercise. So from a, from a youth perspective, uh, I think, you know, once we get uh, athletics back up and running and, and, you know, if you can get your child to substitute some form of exercise every day, uh, I think you're going to find a little bit of a brighter kid as well. Yeah, I can completely agree. And again, it's easy for us because we personally, you and I, um, incorporate exercise. We know we're happier, healthier, better people for that. And um, I hope that message resonates with parents, caregivers, teachers out there to do all they can to help their kids be active and find something they like to do. Um, whether it is, even if it is sitting on a bike or going for a walk or playing a game of tag around their house, it's so important for their mental well-being as well as their weight management, their cardiovascular, all those different things. Do you... Absolutely. Do you think our kids are going to be any more resilient or grittier after this pandemic? Or you think it's just going to be like a great big Debbie Downer? That sucks. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think as I think if we're going to look back at it five years, I think we're going to find that overall society has become a lot more resilient um, in the long run. It's hard to see the forest through the trees. And it's every day everybody's waking up looking at the tree that's standing right in front of them. Um, and, and it's hard to kind of get the 50,000 foot view. I mean, it's hard to really feel that you're going to be resilient from, you know, isolation and, you know, but I think everybody's learning a little bit more about themselves. Uh, I don't think the pandemic is a good thing. I would, I think everybody wishes uh, they, they didn't have it. 
Um, but I think it's really, I think it definitely, from the exercise standpoint, it's going to test your fortitude to say, all right, I can't go to a gym. Um, I don't want to sit on a couch. I want to move. What can I find uh, that's going to, you know, make me a healthier person? You know, are you going to, you know, sit there and, and kind of succumb to it and say, yeah, you know what, I'm just going to kind of be fat and lazy, which if that's your thing, that's your thing. Uh, for other people, um, I, I think people who normally exercise, they can find something that they can do. And even people who don't normally exercise can find something uh, that that is attractive to them to be able to do and, and to get them moving. You're such a kind man when you say that it's okay to sit on the couch and, and you know, and, and if that's your thing, that's your thing. And I'm like, no, come on, get off the couch. There's so many reasons why you need to get off the couch. So you're much more patient and nicer than me. <laughs> Um, tell me about your new facility. Although Rhode Island is very soon opening its beautiful new location, tell us about it. Yeah, we're very excited. You know, Ortho Rhode Island is opening its new flagship building. It's a 60,000 foot square building, expandable to 100,000 square feet. It's located in the center of the state, which we love. You can see it from 95 North. Um, it is going to become kind of our, our landmark flagship uh, building. It's on the grounds of the Crown Plaza at uh, 300 crossings, uh, which is uh, basically uh, very visible from, from 95 North. Uh, it's an all-in-one facility. We are going to be closing our current Warwick office in Centerville Road, and we were going to be closing our East Greenwich office. We will remain uh, with the Providence office and, and the Wakefield office as our south and north, but uh, providers from the south will come uh, to Warwick and providers from the north will come down to the Warwick. And uh, it's great. It's an all-encompass building, all-in-one stop. It's got a brand new physical therapy and, and hand therapy. Uh, it's got over 52, 56 exam rooms uh, in it, uh, new state-of-the-art MRI, uh, as well as a uh, beautiful surgery center on the top floor uh, as well. So uh, we are we are very excited and, and simultaneously we are opening a biologics institute uh, for uh, non-operative uh, biologic treatments for all conditions. So we are we're excited. Uh, end of March, I believe March 27th is a move-in date. Well, wow, it's I look forward to celebrating it. It's basically exactly a year after the pandemic hits, and then you open this beautiful facility, which I know took a lot longer than a year to plan and build, but that's um, exciting for Rhode Island. Absolutely. Sure. We are very excited. Well, oh, by the way, you so you're still based out of the Providence office. Will you have to pack yourself a lunch to be able to get all the way down to Warwick, or you think this is central enough that you'll be? Well, able I live to in the East. I live in East Greenwich, so it's actually on the way into Providence. So I, I do see people down in the East Greenwich office now. So it's not going to be not be not going to be that bad. We picked Warwick because it's the almost the absolute center of the state. So we got just enough people from the north who will drive south and just enough people from the south who will drive north. And I'm, a, as you said, I'm a native Rhode Islander, so I understand driving in Rhode Island. They're from the south to the north. There's not one bridge you have to cross. So it's perfect. Perfect. Good job. <laughs> well, Dr. Monchik, it has been really nice to catch up with you again. When you talk about socialization and how we managed to get through the pandemic, one of my ways is to do a podcast so that I can get get to connect with people like you again and, and hear the exciting things that you've been doing. So it helps me stay insane as well as running out on those roads out there. Any, any final pieces or words of wisdom that you have for our dear community out here in Rhode Island to help them get to this brightest day on June 20th? What are your final words of wisdom? I, I think my final words of wisdom would be um, you do you, you know, Find something that really you're you're passionate about. So find something that you enjoy. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be a formal program. It doesn't have to be a formal gym. Uh, it doesn't have to be a formal class. Uh, but find something that you enjoy and that that thoroughly you know gives you a smile and, and when you do and and do it. Uh, I think, as you said, uh, any type of movement and and work is is better than none. Great. Thank you so much. It's been fun. Thanks, Michelle. Be well. You too.